Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar on usability testing. Why can't we get it right? My name is John Spear. I'm the founder of Greenlight Guru, and I'll be the moderator for today's event. We've got a special presentation scheduled for you today, and I know our presenter, Mike Drews, is really looking forward to taking a critical look at the way we as an industry do usability testing today and to help you understand how we can do usability testing better while still addressing the regulatory needs and concerns. Before we dive too deep into today's presentation and introduce our presenter and his consultancy, Vascular Sciences, I'm going to touch on a few items real quick. First, today's webinar is going to run for about 60 minutes in total and will include a Q&A session at the end where Mike will answer as many questions as we can get to uh, from uh, the live audience. So I encourage you to submit your questions throughout the webinar and we'll get to as many of those as time permits. I also want to thank uh, many of you submitted questions in advance of today's webinar. So I appreciate those. We'll, we'll touch on uh, quite a few of those questions today as well. Uh, we'll be sharing the full recording and slides with all registrants after the webinar. So keep an eye out for that email sometime later today. Folks, I'm going to repeat that because this is always the most common question or comment we get during these webinars. There will be a full recording of today's uh, presentation and the slides coming to your inbox probably later today. So it, you're definitely going to get it. Uh, so just be patient. I'd also like to share a few words about Greenlight Guru and why we put on these free training sessions. If you participated in one of our training sessions before, then you know that we put these on because improving the quality of life is our mission here at Greenlight Guru. And this is likely a mission that's very similar to many of you and your companies tuning in right now. It's also the reason we launched the MedTech Excellence Community, an industry-specific destination for MedTech professionals, which features everything from forums and discussion boards to our job board in the Ask Me Anything sessions. So I encourage you to visit community.greenlight dot guru to join for free today we're constantly looking for ways to fulfill our mission on improving the quality of life whether that's through launching the greenlight guru academy and community programs offering free valuable content like these webinar training sessions or by partnering with world-class medical device consultants like today's presenter mike drews as well as our award-winning quality management software solution for those of you who are interested in getting a personalized demo of Greenlight Guru software, someone from our team will be re reaching out to you after today's webinar. If you haven't connected with us yet, but want to, after the webinar, head over to www.greenlight.guru and schedule an intro call with us, and we'll show you how our purpose-built solution can best serve your medical device needs. You'll learn how the very best medical device companies across the globe are leveraging our purpose-built quality management software to meet other needs like market clearance and approval from FDA, compliance with EU MDR and IVDR, ISO 13485 certification, as well as making audits as simple as they could possibly be and pushing beyond baseline compliance to deliver true quality medical devices to patients. Now, let's get on to today's presentation. Let me give a proper introduction to our presenter today and distinguished partner of ours here at Greenlight Guru, Dr. Mike Drews. Mike Drews, PhD, is president of Vascular Sciences, a consulting and training company offering a broad range of services to medical device, pharmaceutical, and biotechnology companies, including, including creative regulatory strategy and competitive regulatory intelligence, regulatory submission design, FDA presentation, preparation, and defense. Mike is an internationally recognized expert who brings a breadth of knowledge and a hands-on experience and his teachings from the ongoing work he does for FDA, Health Canada, and other regulatory and government agencies around the world. He's also a featured keynote speaker on cutting edge medical technologies and regulatory affairs. If you are familiar with the Global Medical Device Podcast, then you'll recognize his voice right away as he's a long time frequent guest on the show. So without further ado, let me hand things over to today's presenter, Mike Drews. Well, thank you, John, for that very kind introduction. And thank you to you as well as to my many Greenlight Guru friends 
for the opportunity to uh, put on this webinar today. And obviously a special thanks to all of you in the audience, both those of you that are listening right now in real time, as well as those of you that may be listening to the recording in the future, because without you, we would obviously be just wasting our time. So as John said, the topic of today's webinar is usability testing. Now, before you just think, oh my gosh, this is just going to be another boring presentation on usability testing, regurgitating FDA regulation and guidance. For those of you that don't that don't know me already, you know that, um, or you're going to quickly find that I'm not going to take that approach, because in spite of the fact that we do usability testing on most medical devices today, we continue to be plagued with many usability problems, and so that's the reason for the the subtitle of this particular webinar, Why Can't We Get It Right? Uh, or maybe another alternative subtitle might be, it's not going to be your grandmother's approach to usability testing. There's been a lot of people, both from FDA as well as industry, who have droned on about this topic in the past, and yet we still seem to have problems. And so I wanna to try to cut through all of that. Um, John mentioned uh, a bit of my background, and my background is in the handout that is uh, that goes along with this particular webinar, but I just want to emphasize uh, two things about my background. First of all, in addition to working as a regulatory consultant for a wide variety of medical device uh, companies, I also work as a consultant for the FDA as well as Health Canada and a few of the other regulatory agencies around the world. And there's not a lot of people that can say that, that work on both sides of that proverbial fence. And so I really try to use that to my advantage. And the last thing that I just want to say about myself, uh, is I'm a contributing editor to several of the largest medical technology and regulatory publications, including Greenlight. But uh, here are links to a number of my uh, columns and articles and uh, webinars and podcasts and a variety of different sources. So I would encourage you to to check those out as you're as you're interested. So specifically getting into the topic of usability today, here's what I'm hoping to discuss in the short time that we have together. What is usability testing? And more, much more important than that, why is it important? Why is usability testing today the rule rather than the exception? As some of you may know, it was not always that ca the case. As a matter of fact, just a few years ago, it was pretty uncommon for companies to do usability testing on their devices. And now almost everybody does it. So the question is why, what has changed? Does usability differ for devices that are used by patients versus devices that are gonna be used by healthcare professionals? How does usability differ pre-market versus post-market? Uh, how can we do usability testing better, uh, more realistically, while at the same time ticking the regulatory boxes, meeting the regulatory requirements? What are the usability challenges uh, in the future? Uh, for example, with personalized medicine, i.e. 3D printed medical devices, and how do we meet them? And then I decided to throw in one or possibly a couple of bonus questions, time permitting, What's the difference between a usability study and a clinical trial? This is a very common question that I get from a lot of my customers, and I'm going to be sharing lots of tips and tricks throughout our discussion together, time permitting, and then I'll wrap this up with a few final thoughts at the very end, and then we'll open this up to some uh, questions and answers and discussion at the end. So the first question to talk about a bit is what is usability testing, and much, much more important, why is it important? Uh, so here's sort of a, a simple definition of usability testing, evaluating a product by testing it with representative users. And I actually like that very simple definition. You know, Einstein, very smart guy, Einstein said if you can't explain something simply, you don't, under well, you don't understand it well enough. If you can't explain something simply, you don't understand it well enough. So here's a pretty simple definition, a working definition of usability testing. And we can pick it apart, for example, um, what does that mean? What, how do we evaluate uh, the, the, the product? For example, are we talking about only on-label use or would we allow for off-label use? One of my many frustrations uh, about so many people in this business is that when they do testing, including usability testing, they limit their testing to only the on-label use of the product. And in my opinion, although you might be meeting the regulatory requirements there, you are defeating the entire purpose of doing usability testing. That is trying to understand how your product will actually be used in the in real world. And I'll show you some ramifications of this uh, uh, in some of the examples and some of the case studies that we talk about today. 
And taking this a step further, what about what's called anticipated off-label use? Anticipated off-label use. In other words, I don't really care what you have on your label. The question is, is there an anticip anticipation or an expectation that people are going to use your device in other ways that might not, in fact, be on your label? If that's the case, then this is what we call anticipated off-label use. And you, you really should be doing testing uh, for that as well. Not necessarily from a regulatory perspective, but from a product liability perspective. I'll, I'll tell you more about that as we continue on. When do you evaluate your device? In other words, what part of the product development life cycle? How early in the product development life cycle? For those of you that know something about usability testing, you know that traditionally we break usability testing into two sort of phases, if you will. First is the formative usability testing, and then that is followed by the substantive usability testing. So what's the difference? Formative usability testing happens before the design freeze before the design freeze, while the product is still being developed. And the purpose of the formative testing is simply to provide feedback to the engineers, to the designers, about how their product is, is working. In other words, if they want to make changes to the design or something like that to make it more usable, so to speak. That would be the part of uh, usability we call formative testing. And strictly speaking, because that is before your design freeze, that is not part of your final VMV or final verification and validation testing, which kind of begs the question, if we were to go off on a small tangent here, does FDA have the statutory authority to regulate formative usability testing? One could easily argue that because it's still part of development, FDA does not have the authority to regulate it, even though in many cases they still try to do it. Uh, but, you know, it's, it's, it's interesting how many companies have not pushed back on that. On the other hand, when it comes to summative usability testing, that occurs after the point of design freeze, and that is definitely part of your final VNV testing, and therefore it is definitely under FDA's uh, bailiwick. And the purpose of the summative testing is to make sure that your device uh, can be used uh, the way that it's intended to be used. So formative testing happens before the um, design freeze, and it's not part of your formal VNV. After the, the design freeze is achieved, uh, that's when we do summative testing, and that is part of your, your VNV. Parsing this uh, even further, so who are these representative users? In some cases, they might be patients. In some cases, they might be healthcare providers, a physician, a surgeon, a nurse, a pharmacist. In some cases, it might be both. In some cases, it might be somebody else. So you have to identify your representative users. You know, Statistics 101 says that your sample has to be representative of your population. Your sample has to be representative of your population. So this is not unique to usability. This is basic statistics. If your device is intended to be used by a certain population of people, whether they're patients or caregivers or whoever, I don't care, then your usability study has to include people representative of that sample. Your sample has to be representative of the population. Uh, how many users, how many groups, where should the evaluation be done, and so on and so on. For those of you that have taken a look at some of FDA's guidances on usability, FDA suggests typically 15 users per group. Well, I've said to FDA many times, and remember I work as a consultant for the agency, you really should not give numbers like that to people because they don't understand where they come from. Those numbers did not just simply fall out of the sky. In some cases, 15 users might be appropriate. In other cases, 15 users may not be close to enough. And in yet in other cases, maybe 15 users might be total overkill. overkill. So just like when you're doing a clinical trial or when you're testing a device on uh, a bench top, you have to consider the statistical power of your, of your sample. In other words, how many, in this case, users do we need to make a sig statistically significant determination that the usability study will be valid? Similarly, with regard to the number of groups, uh, sometimes it might be that uh, only one group, like only patients, will be using your device. In that case, you might have only one group of people, one group of patients to test your device. In other cases, 
uh, you might have multiple groups. Sometimes maybe doctors might be using it. Sometimes maybe uh, uh, patients. Sometimes maybe nurses and so on. So you you have to decide. You know how many user groups are necessary to represent your intended user population. Where should this evaluation be done? Uh, if if the device is intended to be used in the hospital, then doing your usability study in the hospital or a simulated environment to the hospital is probably appropriate. On the other hand, if your device is intended to be used in the home, then testing it in the home or in a simulated home environment would be appropriate. So you have to consider the, the, the environment where the device is gonna be used. And there's a litany of questions that we can go on with this. But here's my recommendation at this point. Your answers to these questions, not just the questions that I mentioned, but all the others that go along with it, your answers should be based on common sense, not, underlying not, regulatory requirements. That's when people get into problems. There's an adage that I used to say to my medical students back in the day when I used to teach medical school, and that is the surgery went perfectly, but the patient died anyway. I'll say that one more time. The surgery went perfectly, but the patient died anyway. The medical device equivalent is we designed the medical device perfectly, and yet the patient died anyway. The regulatory equivalent of that is we followed the regulation perfectly. That is, we did all the FDA or Health Canada or whoever asked us to do, and yet the patient died anyway. Unfortunately, these problems happen a lot more frequently than some people might like to think. And I'm going to show you some examples uh, of where this has actually happened. So your answers should be based on common sense, hopefully common sense coming from engineering and biology. That's part one. And then part two, regardless of your answers, you need to be able to defend them. Because no matter how many people you choose, no matter how you design your usability study, somebody, myself or somebody else at FDA can criticize you for it. And so you have to be able to defend it. You know, the way um, uh, I'm, I'm a big fan of the, old, the Ronald Reagan mantra, trust but verify. So if I come into the FDA, for example, and I'm in Southern California, the, the sun is shining, the, the sky is blue. If I say to the FDA, the sky is blue, FDA's job is to say, okay, prove it. That's the way this game is supposed to be played. So however you decide to do your usability study, obviously that's up to you, but you need to be able to defend it. This is, what, this is what I'm doing. This is why I'm doing it this way. This is why I'm not doing it that way, and so on and so on. Now, please don't miss my message here. I'm not saying don't follow the rules. I'm certainly not advocating anarchy, but Douglas MacArthur said rules are mostly made to be broken and are too often for the lazy to hide behind. So once again, please don't miss my message. I'm not saying don't follow the rules. What I'm saying is if the rules make sense, then follow them. But if the rules don't make sense, and we follow them anyway, and we agree that they don't make sense, and yet we follow them anyway. Is that a problem with the system, or is that a problem with us? And unfortunately, as we'll see in some examples shortly, some of the rules when it comes to usability or some of the ways that people do usability testing today just simply don't make any sense. So let's shift to the second part of that first question, and that is, why is usability testing important? Simply, my simple answer is to demonstrate that your device can be used as it's intended to be used. To demonstrate to your, that your device can be used the way that it's intended to be used. So as an example, let me just share with you an, an observation that I made about 30 years ago when I first started working in this industry, talking about coronary, uh, coronary stents. These are bare metal stents. Um, one of the things I find interesting is that the people that are designing these stents uh, for the most part, have never held a beating heart in their hand. When you think about it, does that make any sense? You know, it's kind of like asking an engineer to design a car who has never driven a car before. And it's even further complicated in the medical device industry because most medical devices, certainly not all, but most medical devices, like a coronary stent, for example, cannot really be used in, a, in, the, in the real way that they're intended to be used. In other words, unless the R&D engineer is also a cardiac surgeon or an interventional radiologist, they're not going to be able to put a stent into a patient themselves. Yeah, they could do it, you know, with a simulation on the bench top and so on. That's a, a reasonable facsimile, but it's certainly not perfect. So, you know, it, think about this. It's, it's, it's really an interesting, you know, sort of a dilemma, you know, asking an engineer to design a car who has never uh, driven a car before. That's another reason why usability testing is so important. So don't think about this as simply ticking the regulatory boxes because another assumption that many people make is that if you tick the regulatory boxes, 
that means that you've accomplished your objective. You've demonstrated that your device can be used as intended. And I don't think so. I don't think that ticking those regulatory boxes necessarily means that you've done this for the same reason that a lot of people think that if you have a quality management system in place and it ticks all the regulatory boxes, then your QMS works. I have never made such an assumption because I see lots of examples of companies that have quality management systems that tick all the regulatory boxes and yet they do not work. They have very significant problems with them. So be careful about making that assumption. The next uh, objective I wanted to talk about a little bit here is why is usability testing the rule rather than the exception and was it always this way? Well, today, uh, the vast majority, in fact, not all, but but, but the vast majority of medical devices, before they get onto the market, they have to undergo some degree, some amount of usability testing. But back in the day, and I'm not talking about 50 or 100 years ago, I'm talking about literally just about a decade ago, it was extremely uncommon, extremely uncommon for a medical device to undergo usability testing prior to market. In fact, uh, about a decade ago, it was the exception rather than the rule that a medical device underwent usability testing. The question is why? What was the precipitating event that led to now usability testing becoming almost universally required across the medical device universe? And I asked uh, somebody once who, who represented themselves as an expert in usability testing uh, this question and they did not know the answer. So I said to them, well, how could you call yourself an expert in usability testing if you don't know why this has even started? Well, some of you may remember what I call the infusion pump fiasco that happened about a decade ago, where long story short, there were a number of problems that uh, were caused by infusion pumps uh, and that led to about 80 recalls from manufacturers across the board. Uh, many of these problems had to do with uh, the usability of these pumps. For those of you that are not familiar with this, let me uh, share with you a short video that, that talks about it further. Watch this. Infusion pumps provide medications, fluid, and nutrients to patients in healthcare facilities and in the home. They can improve patient care by delivering drugs and other substances with a high level of control, accuracy, and precision. But they've also been a source of persistent safety problems. Over the last five years, FDA has received numerous reports of adverse events associated with external infusion pumps, including serious injuries and deaths. During roughly the same period of time, there were over 80 recalls because of safety issues. Problems have been reported with a variety of pumps, including large volume, syringe, and elastomeric pumps, as well as specialty infusion pumps such as enteral, insulin, and PCA pumps. Many adverse events are attributed to use error, but some are related to problems with device design or engineering, including software defects, user interface issues, and mechanical or electrical failures. These problems can compromise patient care by leading to over or under infusions, mistreatments, or delayed therapy. FDA has launched a new initiative to address these problems in a number of ways. For example, by establishing additional requirements for infusion pump manufacturers and facilitating the development of safer and more effective pumps. In the meantime, there are steps clinicians can take to reduce pump-related risks. Here are some of the things FDA recommends. First, have a backup plan if the pump fails, including how to get a working pump and tubing quickly, and how to get a backup battery or power supply. Use instruction manuals or troubleshooting guides, as well as the pump's drug library if applicable. And remember the five rights for medication administration. The right patient, drug, dose, route, and time. If appropriate, label infusion pump channels and tubing with the name of the medication or fluid to help avoid errors. Don't use a pump if it's broken or damaged, even if there are only small chips or cracks. And don't use a pump if an unexplained alarm occurs or if the pump doesn't function as you expect it to. Tag the pump with details about the problem and report it. And finally, be sure that the preventive maintenance recommended by the manufacturer is performed. Okay, so 
uh, we don't have time to get into this particular case in detail, but suffice it to say, this was the precipitating event, if you will, that led to uh, usability uh, testing being um, uh, required in most medical devices across the board. And this is one of those small examples, one of those watershed moments that really changed the direction of the medical device industry. Just like the silicone breast fiasco uh, led to the biocompatibility testing requirements that we have today. Just like the, um, the tragedy that occurred at UCLA and other places with the duodenoscopes that led to contamination and the reprocessing requirements uh, now in place for a lot of medical devices today. I put the number of, the, of watershed moments or precipitating events very, very small, but the infusion pump fiasco is one of them. And the, the last thing that I want to say in this particular uh, example is when this occurred about uh, a decade ago, I was one of a number of people that were invited to come into the FDA and talk about this uh, because at the time there were actually people in the agency as well as in the industry that were ad advocating uh, clinical trials be required for infusion pumps. Think about it, a clinical trial for an infusion pump. In my opinion, that's nuts. Why? Because there's nothing that you can test for, uh, test an infusion pump for in a clinical trial that you cannot test for on the bench top. So this is sort of a classic overreaction when the pendulum swings from one extreme to the other. Uh, but that was, uh, fortunately, it didn't uh, go quite that far. All right, continuing on, here are some of the major usability guidances that have come out of FDA. Uh, and I just want to point out that these are all w uh, fairly recent, within the last half dozen years. So what happened before 2016? Remember, I said the infusion pump fiasco happened roughly a decade ago. To be fair, uh, the, um, there, there were some versions of the guidance that, that were uh, issued uh, earlier than this, but it really wasn't until uh, very recently that this was, uh, that this was um, uh, recommended. But it does beg the question, as I, as I mentioned earlier, should FDA regulate usability, especially when it comes to formative usability? Now, please don't miss my message here. I'm not saying that usability is not important. I'm certainly not saying that companies should not do usability testing. On the contrary, I think that virtually every company needs to do usability testing. The question is, should we be doing it because it's required, because it's something that you know Big Brother tells us that we have to do, or is it something that we as responsible medical device professionals know that we should do and therefore we should do it anyway? Unfortunately, this is exactly why we have the thousands and thousands of pages of regulation that we have, most of which in my opinion is totally unnecessary because if you know what you're doing, if you know how to develop and test a medical device properly, you don't need to be micromanaged. You don't need to be told by FDA or Big Brother or anybody else what to do. You know what to do. But regrettably, I didn't fall off the turnip truck yesterday. I know that there are people out there, and I'm not trying to be you know, overly critical, but rather just honest, that don't know what they're doing. Or I also know that there are companies out there that do take shortcuts and they only will do things that they absolutely have to be do them if they're, if they're required. That's just a unfortunate uh, reality of our world. The other thing that I wanted to mention about this particular slide is that I've highlighted these guidances uh, based on their categories. So for example, the bottom two are medical device guidances. The two above that are combination products and the one on the top is drugs and biologics. It's very easy for somebody to dismiss, say, a combination product guidance or a drug and biologic guidance if they're only working on a medical device. I think that's a huge mistake. Why? Because there's a lot of commonalities, especially when it comes to uh, usability testing, that you can learn how do we do usability testing for a combination product that might apply to a medical device or vice versa. How do we do usability for medical devices that applies to a combination product? So don't be myopic. Don't think that, well, I'm developing a medical device, therefore uh, usability for combination products is not relevant to me. I think that is a, that is a real mistake. So make sure that you have a, a broader view of the universe than that. And the last thing that I want to say about this particular guidance, which was the, the last one on the previous list, is be very, very careful, as Elmer Fudd said in the Bugs Bunny cartoon about using this particular guidance, the list of highest priority devices for human factors review, because some of my customers have asked me, well, 
if my device is not on this list in this guidance that just came out a few years ago, does that mean that I don't have to do usability testing? I say to them, absolutely not, at least not necessarily. This is the highest priority one, but this is not a list of all devices that have to undergo usability testing. As a matter of fact, let me give you a, a, a recommendation here. If <coughs> I would make the assumption, if you're working on a regulated medical device, I would make the assumption that usability testing is probably expected for your device. And if you genuinely feel that usability testing is not necessary for your device, you're in the exception rather than the rule, but that's fine, you need to go to the FDA, ideally in a pre-submission meeting, and you need to say to them, we are not planning on doing usability testing, and here are all the reasons why. Uh, and that way you can make sure that FDA sees it uh, the same way that you do. And the regulatory logic here is substantially equivalent, pun intended, to this particular uh, guidance that came out just a couple of years ago on biocompatibility. I happen to be a subject matter expert for FDA in a few different areas, one of them on biocompatibility. And before I, before FDA issued this guidance, I said, be careful because one could interpret this guidance. This particular guidance is basically saying that for certain kinds of medical devices, you don't have to do uh, biocompatibility testing. I said to FDA, well, be careful because some people mis mis might misinterpret that or misunderstand it. So I'm just simply pointing it out here that the, that the regulatory logic here is exactly the same as the usability guidance that I pointed at in a, a moment ago. All right, so let's take uh, a look at another case study, a usability problem with another medical product. This happens to be the EpiPen. This is actually a combination product, but it doesn't matter that the, the bench principles are the same. And to, uh, for those of you that are not familiar with this case, let me share you, uh, with you a short video on this. Watch this. We want to thank you so much for coming. We're so happy. Hi, we're happy that the EpiPen is on the defensive this morning. A new report shows a big rise in complaints about the device not working in life-threatening emergencies. Bloomberg says 220 people this year reported failures of EpiPen, which injects a drug that can cause severe allergic reactions. That's up from 2012, when just four failures were reported. Tony DeCopo shows us one family's scary experience and Mylan's response to the report. Tony, good morning. Good morning. Mylan doesn't take issue with the data, but says Bloomberg's article is misleading. It says a rise in reports of failures doesn't necessarily mean a rise in actual failures and suggests heightened attention on the company and increased prescriptions could be to blame. Of course, for those who depend on the device, any failure is unacceptable. Watching your child sit their screen saying, you don't let me die, is awful for any parent to have to go through. Tina Hampton's what? moment of panic was made worse after she reached for an EpiPen. This past spring, her six-year-old daughter, whom she doesn't want on camera, was gasping for breath after an allergic reaction to peanuts. And when I pulled it out, the needle did not go back inside of the Evie pen. It was bent. It sliced her daughter's leg, leaving a scar. She credits a backup Evie pen for saving her child's life. Bloomberg obtained data from the FDA linking 228 reports of Evie pen failures to seven deaths and 35 hospitalizations this year. The FDA cautions that with its reporting system, there is no certainty that the reported event was due to the product. It's a very easy device to use, but someone in a panic might use it wrong. Like Dr. Scott Fisher is a pediatric allergy expert. He showed us how quickly the EpiPen deploys. One, two, three. Slow motion gives a better look at how it delivers a dose of epinephrine, just one shot per device. In emergencies, he said some folks get confused, holding it the wrong way. When they press it, they then get the medication into their thumb. I just want to pause the video for a second and interject a comment. How obvious can it be? I mean, if, if nobody anticipated this particular problem, that in an acute scenario like this, and keep in mind this, what the DOD, the, the, the military calls situational awareness here, when the patient is going to use a product like this, it's, they're, they're probably having a pretty significant anaphylactic shock, and if they don't use the product properly, then they're going to get, you know, very sick. They're, they might even die. And so is it really beyond the, 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 the realm of imagination to think that, gee, maybe somebody might grab the pen and hold it upside down and, as the doctor just illustrated, uh, inject themselves in the thumb as opposed to in the thigh? Think about that. And why was that not detected prior to market? Here's the rest of the video. <laughs> 
despite the increase in reports of failures since 2012, Milan says no changes have been made to the EpiPen device since 2009. I find it interesting that the company is basically saying, well, the problem is not with us. The problem is not with our product, but is rather with the way people are using it. Well, again, as an engineer, I find that, quite frankly, a, a difficult pill to swallow. Here's the last bit of the video. The company says they haven't found a causal connection between reported patient deaths and the EpiPen. Now, there was a recall of some EpiPens earlier this year due to a defective part, but the FDA tells us we are not aware of defective EpiPens currently on the market and recommend that consumers use their prescribed epinephrine auto-injector. Now, as Regina Hampton, the mom at the beginning who uh, had the scar on her daughter's leg, she has switched to a competing injector. Okay, so you get the idea. The question is, why did this happen? Now, again, I'll be the first to admit that hindsight is 2020. It's always easier to play armchair quarterback and look back and say, well, gee, somebody should have anticipated this problem. Um, and obviously, nobody can anticipate all problems. But anticipating the problem is only part of the usability testing. The other part is the actual testing itself. And the way we do testing, and I'm going to show you a couple of examples of this as we continue, is just so controlled, I would say so contrived, that we really go out of our way to avoid finding problems such as the ones that were demonstrated in this video. And uh, the last comment that I want to make quickly about this particular case, uh, what you see on the screen right now is the data that they, uh, that they um, presented in the video. This is factually correct data. However, it is at the same time uh, uh, totally biased, completely biased. Why? Because although this is the number of problems per year that have been reported, it's not normalized. In other words, it's not, um, we, we haven't divided it by the number of products that are actually being used. So the point that I'm making here is a lot of people think that if data is factually correct, that it cannot be biased. On the contrary, here's a classic example of something that is factually correct, but at the same time inherently biased because we have no information, at least not on this particular histogram of, uh, that shows the, uh, the, 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 the frequency of these problems as a, as a function of number of devices used or something like that. So uh, I'll leave this as a bit of a rhetorical question, something for you and the audience to think about, or maybe we can discuss it at the end of the webinar. Why is this happening? And if you were in a situation like this, what would you do? All right, continuing on to the next question. Does usability differ for medical devices that are being used by patients as opposed to devices that are being used by healthcare professionals? And I would argue absolutely it does, or at least it does in theory. But not necessarily always in reality, because unfortunately in the regulatory world, theory and reality are not always uh, one and the same. As a matter of fact, I've said in some of my podcast discussions with uh, John on our, on our green light series that the, the importance of usability, well, first of all, usability is important for virtually all medical devices across the board. However, the importance for usability test uh, for sorry the importance for usability in devices that are going to be used directly by a patient is much much higher is much much greater than the importance for usability for devices used by healthcare professionals now again don't get me wrong i'm not saying that if you are working on a medical device that's going to be used by a doctor or a surgeon that usability is not important of course it is but what I'm saying is, relatively speaking, it's more important for devices that are being used by patients. Why? Very simple. Because when a healthcare provider uses a device, we assume that they have gone through medical school or nursing school or pharmacy school or what have you. In other words, they're a trained medical uh, or healthcare professional. Now, on a, as a side note, I got to mention, because I used to teach medical school back in the day, I was constantly reminded of the old joke, what do you call the person that graduates last in their class in medical school? Doctor. So just because somebody has graduated med school and has MD after their name or RD, uh, sorry, RN or PhD or something like that, as Shania Twain said in her song, doesn't impress me much. But assuming that they do know what they're doing, usability for devices used by a patient especially a patient unsupervised in a home, is much, much more important than for a device used by a skilled medical professional. However, ironic as it sounds, nowhere in the regulation or the guidance is this written down. As a matter of fact, 
we don't usually distinguish uh, when it comes to usability between devices used by a patient versus a, a healthcare professional. Should we? Well, I would like to think that we don't need that level of regulation. I would like to think that we don't need that level of micromanagement, that those of us working in this field know what we're doing and we know that already. But unfortunately, I said before, I didn't fall off the turnip truck yesterday. Regrettably, there are those people in this business uh, who seem not to know that or don't do that. But, the, but there is a big difference between the two. And just a quick illustration, let me share with you two devices. I've sort of non-dimensionalized them a little bit, but these are two devices that uh, I've been involved with recently. Let's do a quick compare and contrast. On the left, we have an, uh, a device that's indicated for intraocular injections. In other words, injecting a drug into somebody's eye. And on the right, we have basically a saliva-based in vitro diagnostic. And this portion of the device is nothing more than spitting in a tube. That's literally all it is, spitting in a tube. So in which case is usability testing more important or more critical? Well, I'm not going to take the time to open this up as a polling question, but I would assume that the vast majority of you in this audience would probably say, at least I would hope that you would say, that usability for a device indicated for intraocular injection is obviously much, much more important, more critical than usability of a device that, where you just simply spit in the tube. Unfortunately, the reality is not so simple because when this particular product went through, it required zero usability testing. None, nada, not one little bit. And the regulatory justification, and in my opinion, this was a weak justification. This is why, you know, when a company gets a 510K, that's what the academic equivalent of being a C student. The regulatory justification is that this was a 510K, therefore this was well-established technology, and therefore usability testing is not necessary. On the other hand, Coming back to our spitting in the tube example, what happened in that particular case? Well, there was an extreme amount of uh, usability testing required. As a matter of fact, uh, I want to share with you my redacted version of the company's additional information request uh, hold letter that FDA sent to the company. This is not going to be in the packet of information uh, in the handout but I'll just share it with you on the screen. And I just want to share with you some of the things that FDA said about the usability study for this particular device. The agency determined that the study that the company conducted is not sufficient to evaluate lay user collection and labeling comprehension of your device per its intended use. Now keep in mind, this is nothing more than spitting in a tube. The FDA said you did not provide protocols and detailed results from a user comprehension study. You should conduct a user comprehension study to evaluate the lay user collection and labeling comprehension. You've not provided instruction material and, and described the mode of instructions that you've used uh, in this submission. You should provide study material and instructions used in your new user comprehension study to the FDA. You've not included, uh, I'm sorry, I missed a piece of it. You've not included demographics of the study population. If you intended, uh, if your intended use population represents the U.S. general population, your study participants should represent four U.S. consensus regions. In other words, South, Midwest, Northeast, and West. Keep in mind, this is for spitting in a tube. I've gotten medical devices onto the market in some cases that did, that were permanent implants that went into people's bodies for the rest of their lives where we didn't do this level of testing. You have not provided statistical analysis and predefined acceptance criteria for your comprehension study. Uh, you should have a predefined acceptance criteria for your study uh, and then provide overall pass rate for all tasks and confirm if your study meets the acceptance criteria, identify and account for all sources of bias in the study results. You have not surmised, sorry, you have not sum summarized study results in your user comprehension study. You should provide summarized user comprehension results. Uh, you should include a summary table showing comprehension results regarding comprehension uh, concepts relevant to your proposed device. You have not provided survey parameters. Um, you have not provided a flesh contained reading analysis of this particular device's labeling uh, and on and on. So all of this feedback, uh, basically FDA was rejecting the company's usability study. Now, in this particular case, actually the company made the submission to the FDA before they brought me in.
and then they got this uh, hold letter, and that's when they brought me in to kind of help clean up the mess. And I said to the company, well, yeah, I'm happy to help clean up the mess, but I wish you would have brought me in, you know, six months or a year earlier because it would have been a heck of a lot easier and faster and cheaper to avoid having this mess to begin with than to have the mess and then uh, afterwards have to clean it up. So what was the regulatory justification? And again, my opinion, very weak justification. This particular product was being bringing onto the, being brought onto the market as a, de, as a de novo. But here's the important part. A de novo, obviously, unlike a 510K, is for new, not established technologies. But the new technology here, the justification was for the de novo was the in vitro diagnostic. It was not it was not the collection method of literally spitting in the tube. So in my professional opinion, this was an over ask by the agency. They were being too uh, uh, burdensome here. And as a matter of fact, in this particular case, one of the things that we did was we threw the least burdensome flag. Uh, and if you're not familiar with what that is, I would just refer you to the podcast that John Spear and I did for Greenlight about a year ago called When to Throw the Least Burdensome Flag on the FDA. That was a good discussion. It's one of our popular podcasts. If you think that FDA is being overly burdensome, and in this particular case, we generally thought that they were being overly burdensome, we threw the least burdensome flag. And long story short, the company was successful and we were able to uh, not totally eliminate the use of usability testing here uh, because that would go too far in my opinion, but certainly greatly reduce the burden on usability testing for uh, a pretty simple ac uh, action of spitting in a tube. On the contrary, you know, contrast that with the, the example on the right of an intraocular uh, injection where no usability testing was, was necessary, uh, or at least was deemed necessary. I didn't say it wasn't necessary for me, but it was deemed unnecessary for the reasons that we just discussed. So what's the root cause of this problem? You know, as an engineer, I, I, I like to think about root cause. And by the way, oftentimes when I hear people discussing root cause, they really never get anywhere close to the real root cause. They're all dancing around the surface, you know, talking about the, the superficial manifestations of much, much deeper problems. And I think the deeper problem here is in the thinking. In other words, what's, behind, what's between people's ears? The root cause of this kind of a problem, in my opinion, is when we have people that are following regulation like a mindless automaton, um, in other words, without thinking. And what's a mindless automaton? Somebody who follows instructions blindly and to the letter, never exercising judgment or common sense. The, the, the regulations and the, and the guidance should be thought of as guidelines. They should be thought of as, um, as suggestions, but they should not be considered written in stone. You always have the ability to, mm, I don't want to say manipulate them, but adjust them depending on the needs of your particular device, your particular situation, and so on. But unfortunately, when people do follow this mindless approach to regulation, in other words, following regulation like a recipe, step one, do this, step two, do that, or worse, uh, following regula regulation like a uh, computer executes lines of code one after another without stopping and asking, does this make sense? This is unfortunately one of the things that what, what gives regulatory a bad name. And so I do not advocate practice like that. I advocate doing what makes sense or using what I like to call regulatory logic. So just a few more things to talk about here before we uh, open this up to some questions and some discussions. And if you haven't done so already, I would invite you to type in some questions into the um, into the uh, website there so that we can talk about them after the fact. How does usability differ pre-market versus post-market? Well, we've already talked about that pre-market uh, usability testing typically involves two phases formative and summative testing. The formative is pre-design freeze where we're simply trying to provide feedback to the designers. Summative is post-design freeze, part of V&V &V testing and therefore uh, certainly fair game to FDA. But when it comes to usability testing, this is where most people stop. And then that's another big problem because there's something big missing here. What's big missing here? And that is the importance of 
post-market usability testing. In other words, uh, the importance or the role of post-market surveillance in usability testing. In fact, FDA doesn't have a specific guidance on this, but they do have a section on their website talking about human factors and post-market surveillance. And if you're not familiar with this, and I suspect many of you are probably not, because post-market surveillance uh, for usability testing is not something that most of my customers have even uh, thought about or considered until I bring it up with them. Uh, you might want to check this out. The question is, talk is cheap. Is this theory or reality? Well, let's take a look at another real world example, another of my many favorite examples of usability testing or the lack thereof, and that is the Da Vinci surgical robot. For those of you that are not familiar with this particular case, here's a video to illustrate. Watch this. There's no question that the Da Vinci surgical robot, seen here in a marketing video suturing a grave with precision and ease, can do extraordinary things. The only surgical robot of its kind. Many doctors, like heart surgeon Dr. Robert Poston, seen here using the Da Vinci, are believers. The patients recover quicker, less blood loss, there's less complications. That's because there's no big incision. It's laparoscopic surgery on steroids. The robot controls the instruments guided by the doctor at a console. My ability to be precise is better, even than my own hands. But the Da Vinci is not without problems. In the last 10 years, there were 22,000 adverse events filed in an FDA database shedding a range of issues associated with the Da Vinci, from the most minor malfunctions to 274 deaths. 22,000 adverse events. 274 deaths, many, certainly not all, many of these directly related to usability or the lack thereof. This product did get onto the market. It ticked all the regulatory uh, boxes, and yet we're still having all these problems. Why? Uh, so this illustrates not just the importance of post-market usability, uh, uh, the importance of post-market usability, but also the fact that simply ticking boxes on the form is not always a good enough approach. Here's the rest of the video. Lori Featherstone, who lives with her daughter in Algina, Iowa, wishes she'd ask more questions before having robotic surgery. Is she sick right now? Are you okay? Yes. Um, all day, every day. Okay. Three years ago, her doctor told her she needed a hysterectomy. She told me that I needed to choose whether to have a robot or a surgeon. And if she were me, she would elect to have the robot. Um, less downtime, less scarring. But Lori had serious complications. Basically, my kidneys were drowning. They found that my ureter had um, some type of thermal injury. So somewhere in the course of the surgery, you were burnt. Uh -huh. Her doctor's post-operative report confirms that, also noting her colon was damaged. She's now facing a permanent colostomy. All this two years after Da Vinci's manufacturer, Intuitive Surgical, had been put on notice in a strongly worded letter from the FDA that, among other things, burning was a problem. Sadly, Lori is alone. NBC News has spoken to more than a dozen patients, many of whom are suing, who say they were burned or otherwise injured during surgery with the Da Vinci, something we saw reported over and over again in FDA documents. Surgeon observed a flame, burn injury to small bowel, a burn injury to the liver. And while Dr. Poston has now performed 1,200 surgeries using the Da Vinci, he tells us before doing his first, he had only two hours of practice on the device and is extremely worried about the lack of doctor training. If you want to fly a commercial airplane, it takes you 1,500 hours. But you can fly a robot after training, which isn't really that rigorous. In fact, there are no national requirements regulating how much training a surgeon must have to operate using the Da Vinci. The FDA says it doesn't have jurisdiction. And while Intuitive Surgical offers a four-level training program, it cannot require surgeons to complete it. The root cause here is the training. The willingness to sell robots to people and promote them doing surgeries when they weren't adequately trained, the willingness of hospital credentialing committees to sign off on them and allow them to do it. Dr. Poston hopes every surgeon will search his or her own conscience. We should live in a world where we practice brutal transparency, 
with our patients. So if we lived in that world, we would tell the patient, I'd like to operate on you, but I didn't have the time or money to have all the training that I really think that we ought to have had. Is that okay? Is that okay? Would, would you be okay with that? The robots manufacturer tells NBC News that they, quote, offer a comprehensive intensive training program that depends on the surgeon's capabilities and that they also strongly recommend that surgeons continue training throughout their careers. Now, Lori Featherstone filed suit against Intuitive, but later voluntarily withdrew it. She says, ask questions. And in the interest of, in full disclosure, as some of you may know, if you've heard some of my other podcasts or webinars, I spend some of my time working as an expert witness in medical device product liability cases, and this is, in fact, one of those cases. So there's a tremendous amount of lessons to be learned here uh, in this particular case of not just what to do when it comes to usability testing, but what not to do. And I would encourage you, we don't have time to get into this in, in more detail, but I would encourage you to um, take this case back to your particular organization, and I've included in the handout some of my questions for discussion, and use this as a as a teaching moment in your organization to see if uh, if some of these problems might happen to you. Even if you're not working in laparoscopy, even if you're not working in surgery, these kinds of basic problems uh, happen to medical devices across the board. Because if you don't do this, if you're not proactive, then let me show you what can happen next. Watch this. Attention to Vinci surgical robot patients. If you had a hysterectomy or prostate surgery performed by the Da Vinci surgical robot and suffered medical complications, call 800-800-1919. If you had to undergo additional surgeries due to complications, call us. If you are considering robot surgery, get the facts first at thatrobotsurgery.com. I love that URL, badrobotsurgery.com. Uh, but anyway, the point here is when I work with my customers, I always try to encourage them to do what I think is necessary to do because maybe I'm naive, but because it's the right thing. I will then default to say, well, maybe the regulatory requirements uh, will, will require this as well. But if I absolutely have to, if you're not going to do something, your company's not willing to do something because it's required by the FDA, I will raise the possibility of, look, you might be looking at a possible product liability case later on. You know, a lot of my friends in this industry, they tell me that they fear the FDA. I say, no, 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 no. You should not fear the FDA. You should have healthy respect for the FDA, but you should not fear them. Who should you fear? You should fear the product liability authorities because they can instill a heck of a lot more damage to the company than the FDA ever could. So let me just wrap this up with a couple of last things, and then um, we'll wrap this up in a few more minutes, and then we're going to have some time for Q&A afterwards. So hopefully you're typing your questions into the discussion. I hope we're, we're generating some, some good thought-provoking questions here. How can we do usability testing better than we do it today and still tick the regulatory boxes that we're, that we're required to tick? Well, as an example, let me share with you a situation that happened a few years ago. I remember I was, I was giving a presentation at a conference. This was before COVID. And coincidentally, there was a woman presenting just before me who was describing a usability study for their particular medical device. I don't remember what it was. I think it's probably a laparoscopic device, but it doesn't make any difference. And one of the things that she said is that in their usability study, one of their uh, criteria was that the surgeon had to read and follow the directions for use or what some people refer to as the instructions for use, the part of the lower level, low level labeling. And I asked uh, after the presentation, I said, um, uh, cause I wanted to stimulate some discussion on this. And I said, well, you realize now you have totally invalidated, totally invalidated your entire usability study. Why? Because we all know that in the real world, most people don't read, let alone follow, what you write on your DFU. And she said, yes, Mike, you're right, I agree with you, but it passed buster to the FDA. And so the question is, what good is it to do a usability study or indeed any study at all if it's not representative, if it's not realistic of the real world? Once again, I'll leave that as a rhetorical question, but certainly something to think about. What good is it to do a study if it's not representative of the real world? So based on that, here is sort of my wackadoodle two-step usability protocol. All usability studies can, can be boiled down to 
these two steps. Step number one, give the user your device, whether the user is the patient or the surgeon or whoever it is, I don't care. Give the user your device. And then step number two is my wife would say, you can stop talking now. And if one of the things that they do is take your DFU out of the box and throw it in the trash, then you note that down. Now, of course, I always make this device, this advice somewhat facetiously because I know no medical device company on earth will ever want to do a usability study this way. But if you really want to do a usability study and really want to make it uh, accurate and realistic, is this really such a wackadoodle idea? Is it possible or indeed is it possible? What does possible mean? Well, any of you fans of uh, the TV show Dewey Hauser or How I Met Your Mother, watch this. All my life, I have dared to go past what is possible to the impossible, actually past that, to the place where the possible and the impossible meet to become the possible. If I can leave you with one thought, it's this. Nothing and everything is possible. I love that. Nothing is, and everything is possible. Thank you, Doogie Hauser. And yes, I'm dating myself because to me, he will always be Doogie Hauser. But think about it. It is possible to do a usability study that does tick all the regulatory boxes on the form uh, so that you can obviously get your product onto the market, but at the same time, be more realistic than the way we do most usability studies today. So the, the, the last major topic that I want to talk about is the challenges of usability testing for the future, especially when it comes to personalized medical devices like, for example, three-dimensional uh, printing or 3D printed devices. This is an area that I've been working on for a very, very long time. Unfortunately, that is a, a topic of a much more advanced discussion, but suffice it to say, on one hand, it's going to require a really a totally different approach, a different thinking, a different mindset. However, the regulatory logic is substantially equivalent. And once again, that pun is intended. This is another reason why I focus so much more on regulatory logic and so much less on what the regulation actually says. Because if you understand the regulatory logic, you can apply it to anything. I don't care what kind of a medical device is. And further, a good regulatory logic is not just technology agnostic, but is time independent. The regulatory logic will apply not just to the devices that we have today, but to devices that we don't have today, the devices that we might have in the future. And just as a real quick example, I've talked about 3D printed devices in some of my other webinars. Here's an example of being able to 3D print a stent. Uh, and there's no audio on this, so I'll just kind of talk you through it. Imagine in, uh, uh, um, somebody having to get a coronary stent, and instead of having to have it uh, produced in a manufacturing environment and put into a package and sent to a hospital and so on and so on, we actually 3D print the stent right in the uh, cardiac catheterization lab right in the same room that the patient is actually in. And then let me just uh, jump ahead a few seconds so you can actually see the stent being printed. And then we take it out of the 3D printer. Maybe we wash it off a little bit or something and we stick it into the patient and we're done. So this notion of making millions and millions of devices that are the same uh, and giving them to, you know, to, the, to, to everybody, you know, all of your millions of your closest friends, it's an archaic concept when you think about it. It's clearly not the future of medicine. Personalized medicine, whether it's 3D printing or something else, um, is really the future of this industry, not just for medical devices, but for drugs as well. And as you can appreciate, you know, that does go, it is going to uh, impose some challenges when it comes to usability testing. And in this particular case, not just usability of the device itself, being put, putting the device into the patient, but for example, what about the usability of using the 3D printer machine to actually produce the device? That's an aspect of usability testing that most people have never even thought about before. But in the future, that's something that we're probably going to have to be thinking about. The very last thing, and then I'm going to wrap this up, so John, be ready with uh, with our questions for our discussion. Uh, another common question that I get from a lot of my customers, this is our bonus question, what's the difference between a usability study and a clinical trial? Well, the short answer is a clinical trial focuses on the patient whereas a usability study focuses on the user. So to illustrate, think about a scalpel. 
everybody knows what a scalpel is. I have a little scalpel on the screen there. If you're doing a clinical trial for a scalpel, then the focus is going to be on the patient. In other words, is the scalpel able to cut through the tissue without causing too much trauma and, 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 and bleeding and so on and so on? So the focus is on the patient. Is on, the patient. on the other hand, if you're going to do a usability study on exactly the same stud, uh, the scalpel, now the focus is on the user. So can the surgeon hold the, the scalpel in their hand properly? Can they, um, you know, apply enough force to be able to cut through the tissues? Can they uh, manipulate the, the, the scalpel, you know, move it back and forth, you know, and, and, and so on and so on. Those are the usability issues of the scalpel. So a clinical trial focuses on the patient. A usability study focuses on the user. What if in some cases, in a growing number of cases, the patient and the user become one and the same? Well, now, you know, that's a, a different kind of a scenario. In the past, most of our regulation, including usability, uh, made the assumption that the person using the device was a healthcare provider, a, a doctor, for example, whereas the, 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 the patient was somebody that the device was being used on. But nowadays, more and more, we have lots and lots of devices where the patient and the user are one and the same. So can we combine a usability study and a clinical trial? The answer is yes, but, and again, this is a topic for a, a more advanced discussion. Here's my best, best advice. If you want to combine the two, and you certainly can, I was among the first to actually do this with products and get them through the FDA, where we combine the usability study and the clinical trial into one. I strongly recommend that even if you're going to combine them me mechanistically, uh, mentally, you keep them separate because the goals and objectives of a clinical trial and the goals objectives of a usability study are fundamentally different. So even if you want to combine them mechanistically, you still need to be able to tick all of the boxes on the clinical trial side, and you still need to tick all of the boxes on the usability side. In other words, you need to meet the goals and objectives of both. I, I have no problem combining the two when it's appropriate, but just make sure that mentally you kind of keep them separate from one another. So to wrap this up, just a few final thoughts, and then we're going to open this up for some, some uh, questions and some discussion. So what's the takeaway here? Do usability testing if and when it's necessary if and when it's necessary. Some people have, have suggested the FDA, well, maybe we should require usability testing for all medical devices across the board. I'm adamantly against that, 100% against that. As a matter of fact, I'm adamantly, adamantly against any regulation that applies to everything, you know, regardless of what it is, because we do not want to take that approach, that one-size-fits-all approach. So do usability testing if and when it's necessary. In the majority of cases, most of you are probably going to be involved with medical devices that do require usability testing. But if you think, for whatever reasons, that usability testing is not necessary for your device, that's perfectly fine. But remember, you have to justify that to the FDA. So take it to the FDA. I do this frequently in the form of a pre-submission meeting and say, uh, either I'm going to say, here's my usability testing and here's how I'm going to do it, or I say usability testing is not necessary in my particular case and here are all the reasons why it's not necessary. And hopefully FDA will say, yeah, we agree with you. We look forward to, see, to, to seeing your submission. Or if they don't, they say, sorry, we don't see it that way. And then this is where the discussion begins. This is where uh, the poker game begins. Once again, uh, some of you have probably heard me use the poker metaphor before. I characterize the entire relationship between the company and the FDA as a poker game in every sense of the word. And just because somebody understands the rules of poker doesn't necessarily mean they're going to be a good poker player, certainly doesn't mean they're going to win the game. I want to do everything that I can legal, of course. I don't want to be wearing any orange jumpsuits in order to win the game. In other words, you can read 50 books on the rules of poker. Does that mean that you're going to be a good poker player? Does that mean that you're going to win the game? Absolutely not. So do usability testing if and when it's necessary. And maybe this is a little, um, I don't know, altruistic of me, but do it not because it's required, but because it's the responsible thing to do. I genuinely believe that. Remember the adage I shared with you early, earlier, the surgery went perfectly, but the patient died anyway. Something to think about. Do usability testing realistically. Regrettably, it is not required to do a usability study realistically. It is not required to do a clinical trial realistically. As a matter of fact, the way we do most usability studies, and I gave you one or two examples today, and a different example, but the way we do most clinical trials, they are just not realistic of the real world. 
what is the point of doing any test? I don't care if it's a usability test, if it's a clinical trial, if it's something else, if it's not realistic of the real world. Once again, in this particular case, the simple answer is it's not required, but it is the right, the responsible thing to do. And if you're not going to do it for regulatory purposes, then maybe consider doing it for product liability purposes. Because if there's a problem with your product and you get sued, and undoubtedly you will get sued, and opposing counsel gets a, you know, a clever uh, expert witness, somebody like me or somebody you know smarter than me, if they make the case that either you didn't do usability testing or you did it, but you did it in such a contrived way that you went out of your way to avoid finding a problem, like the EpiPen being held upside down and injecting it into your thumb as opposed to into your thigh. You don't have to be, uh, you don't have to have a JD from Harvard Law after your name to, to a, hear ka-ching, ka-ching, ka-ching. Remember, when you get a 510K clearance, when you get a de novo, when you get a PMA approved, when you get a CE mark, when you get a ISO blah, blah, blah certified, that is the academic equivalent of being a C student. That just means that you're passing. That doesn't mean that you're making a safe and effective product. It certainly doesn't mean that you're making a good product, nor does it mean you're making a usable product. Something to think about. And finally, the, the last reminder takeaway here is do usability testing pre-market. In most cases, you have to do that anyway. But don't forget about the importance of doing usability post-market because many of the examples that I shared with you today, the Da Vinci robot, the EpiPen, and so on, these problems regrettably were not found pre-market, but they were found post-market. So on one hand, it's good that we found them, but on the other hand, we really want to be finding them sooner rather than later. So I talked about a lot in the last hour or so when it comes to usability testing, what it is, why it's important, how it differs for devices between patients versus healthcare professionals, the importance of pre and post market usability testing, uh, not simply ticking boxes on the form, a little bit about challenges of the future and the differences between a usability study and a clinical trial. Let me just wrap this up with a couple of quick comments and then once again, we're gonna open this up to some Q&A. There's obviously a lot of regulatory consultants out there, but in my opinion, there are very, very few good ones. So the question is, how do you become a good one if that's your goal or how do you find a good one if you're looking for one? It's very simple. Learn to follow, but more importantly, uh, know when to lead. Because uh, if, if it's to my advantage to follow in somebody else's footsteps, if it's to my advantage to do usability testing the way the 50 or 100 other companies have done it before me, then I'll be the first to go into the FDA and on my PowerPoint in 72 point font, I'll say I'm doing just exactly what the people did before me. End of discussion, don't let the door hit you and you know what. But on the other hand, if it's if it's not appropriate to follow what they did, or indeed if it's not possible to follow what they did, then I will be the first to work with the FDA to carve out a new path because if you want to lead the orchestra, you must first turn your back on the crowd. If you want to lead the orchestra, you must first turn your, turn your back on the crowd. And unfortunately, we don't have a lot of people in this industry that seem to be willing or able to do that. Uh, I think I'm going to skip this one and let me go to this very last one and then John will open this up for some Q&A. If we're going to take inspiration, let's take inspiration from one of the best, Steve Jobs, who changed our world in some very profound ways, not just evolutionary ways, but revolutionary ways. Let me share with you one of his very first ads from Apple Computer where he talked about the crazy ones, the rebels. Watch this. Here's to the crazy ones. The misfits, the rebels, the troublemakers, the round pegs and square holes, the ones who see things differently. They're not fond of rules, and they have no respect for the status quo. You can quote them, disagree with them, glorify or vilify them. About the only thing you can't do is ignore them, because they change them. Push the human race forward. While some may see them as the crazy ones, we are genius. Because the people who are crazy enough to think they can change the world are the ones who do. Call me crazy, call me naive, and certainly many people do, but I'm trying to change the world. I'm trying to make the world a better place one person at a time. It's taking a long time, and if any of you in the audience want to help me, I can certainly use the help. 
but not not to be so arrogant as to put myself in Steve Jobs' category, but when I did my presentation a few years ago at the MD&M in Anaheim on competitive regulatory strategy, one of the, the, the biggest medical device conferences in the world, one of the editors of MDDI magazine was in the audience, and she wrote a column on my presentation, and she characterized me as a regulatory rebel, a regulatory rebel. So in that sense, maybe Steve Jobs might, might be proud. Uh, the, la the last uh, quote that I wanted to share with you is one of my favorite. Imagine where we can be today if discontent for the status quo was the norm rather than the exception. Imagine where we could be today if discontent for the status quo was the norm rather than the exception. Who said this? I said this more than a decade ago in one of my very first uh, columns uh, um, uh, about medical devices. I don't care if we've been using, doing usability testing for a, for a long time. I don't care if we've been doing it a certain way for, you know, for a long time. I don't care if just about everybody does it this way. I don't care if FDA says that we need to do it this way. The question is, does it make sense? If it makes sense, then by all means, we should continue to do it. But if it doesn't make sense, and we continue to do it anyway, and we agree that it doesn't make sense, and we continue to do it anyway, is that a problem with the system, or is that a problem with us? At this point, uh, I want to thank everybody for their attention. I'm happy to open this up now for some discussion. I think, John, we've got another 15 minutes or so for some Q&A, so uh, why don't you take it from here, and, and let's see what else we can talk about. All right, sounds like a plan, Mike, and thank you so much for uh, the time, effort, and energy of presenting today. I know how much you care about this topic. You and I have spoken at length, um, both on the Global Medical Device podcast, as well as just during uh, catch-up calls that we have on, on the importance of usability. But quite a few questions. Uh, let's dive right in. Uh, and we'll, folks, we'll get to as many of those uh, of your questions as time permits. Any questions that we don't get to, to today, uh, they'll be shared with Mike Drews, and uh, I'm, I'm sure he'll reach out and connect with you and follow up after the session. So first question comes from Paige. Paige asks, why do some regulatory consultants think that usability testing doesn't apply to IVD products? Yeah, great question, Paige. Thank you for that question. And um, the short answer is, well, first of all, I don't see anything really overly special or unique about IVDs compared to you know most other medical devices, we have to take it on a case-by-case -case kind of a situation. So the example that I shared with you about the spitting in the tube case earlier in the webinar, that was an in vitro diagnostic. FDA wanted a ton of uh, usability testing specifically on the spitting in the tube portion of the device, which in my opinion was overkill and we threw the least, uh, least burdensome pa uh, um, flag and in that particular case we were successful. I think the reason why some people um, sub, sub, um, separate out IVDs from other kinds of medical devices is because depending on the IVD, once you get the sample from the patient, whether it's saliva or blood or you know some other kind of a bodily bodily tissue or fluid, and you put it into the machine, you know now it's just a matter of you know pushing the right buttons at the right time and and, and, and you're done, right? So in that particular case. I think it's important to demonstrate the, the usability of the machine, the, the graphical user interface, and, they, they, and make sure that they push the right buttons at the right time, and what happens if they don't push the right buttons at the right time, and the potential risks and harms that can result. But um, that is really the only aspect of usability testing that might be a little bit different than, than most other medical devices, like a catheter or, or a hip implant or something like that. So I'm not sure, John, if I'm completely answering Paige's question. If there's anything else that you want to add to it, feel free. Um, no, I think you hit the nail on the head, and I, I think the uh, the spit tube example that you highlighted during the presentation, um, you know, compared and contrasted uh, the the usability needs for different IVD types of things, and I think um, you know my take on this. Sometimes I think people look at what is quote required, you know, which regulatory boxes to tick off from usability. And, you know, sometimes, uh, well, some products technically from a regulatory perspective aren't requiring usability. So I think that might be, uh, you know, at least, you know, in the eyes of the FDA. So I think that uh, actually complicates and creates and, and perpetuates the confusion on this topic. But let's move on to our next question. This comes from Bob. Bob asks, how 
uh, best to plan and develop a small usability study to review subtle changes to existing products and its user interface? Well, great question, Bob. Thank you for asking. Um, it's obviously it's a general question. So I'm assuming that this device is already on the market and they're wanting to make a change to, uh, he, Bob said subtle changes. I'm not sure if it's in the change in the design or the labeling or or something, whatever it is. But here's the thing. From a usability perspective, the company, in my opinion, has an obligation to make sure that whatever those changes are, again, whether it's changing the 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 shape of the device, changing you know the location of a button that the person needs to push or something like that, they need to essentially re-validate re, uh, uh, to make sure that those changes do not create new questions of safety and efficacy. They do not change the overall risk. In other words, the usability should be the same, substantially equivalent, if you will, as the usability prior to the, the, to the change of the device. In the absence of some little bit more specific information, Bob, it's a little hard to give you a more specific response, but in a general sense, that would be my advice. Uh, John, what would you add? Um, well, I mean, I think, I think, you know, subtle changes, I mean, obviously that's a nice ambiguous term. I mean, I think every design, I mean, Mike has spoken quite a bit about design changes and, and things of that nature as well. Uh, anytime you're making a change to something, I mean, you, you still need to uh, address, you know, all of, not just the, the usability uh, of those changes, but um, you also need to address you know, the design control activities and risk and all those sorts of things too. And when I say address, sometimes addressing it you know, might be you know, a simple activity. Other times you might need to go through and, and conduct uh, a more exhaustive uh, hu human factors analysis and that sort of thing. So you know, every change is a little bit different. So I don't know that there's a one size fits all answer to Bob's question. I agree, John. I don't think there's a one size fits all. And to make it a little bit more specific, let me try to take Bob's example and try to meld it a little bit with Paige's uh, question from just a moment ago. Let's assume that we're, because what does subtle change mean? As you alluded to, you know, that's about as nebulous as you can get, right? So let's assume that we have an IVD and let's assume that the IVD has some sort of a computerized, you know, a GUI, a graphical user interface. And let's say, let's assume that your subtle change is maybe a change to the font that's being displayed or a change to the um, size of the font or the color of the font. Most people would probably consider that to be a subtle, maybe even a trivial change. But the question is, how do we know that that subtle or trivial change is not going to impact safety, efficacy, performance? We have some obligation. I'm not talking about, you know, turning this into a five-year, 300-page PhD dissertation, but some sort of an analysis to determine that, yeah, we've changed the font, and still most people are able to read it okay. What if you change the font color, for example, so that it's very similar to the background font color, and now some people are going to have a, just a hard time reading it. And let's say it's on a mission-critical piece of uh, equipment, like it's an IVD for cancer, for example, and as a result, the, because the, the, the user was not able to read the display properly, maybe they concluded that the patient has cancer when in fact they don't, i.e. a false positive, or they don't have cancer when in fact they do, a false negative. The point is, John, that um, a lot of people say, well, this is a subtle change. This is a trivial change. We don't have to worry about it. We don't have to test it. We don't have to do anything. But I really think that that's kind of dangerous thinking. Um, again, I'm not trying to turn this into a, a five-year PhD dissertation, but some at least minimal testing, how much is enough? We can certainly quibble on that, but some amount of testing or analysis I think is warranted uh, for changes like that. Would you agree, John? 100%. Uh, absolutely. Absolutely. All right, let's move to the next question. This comes from uh, Olivia. Olivia's question is, if a home use device is intended to be used the same way over multiple days, could you share briefly how you would recommend us to go about conducting usability to test the lay user's retention of knowledge on the correct usage of the device? 
Yeah, great question, Olivia. Thank you for asking. So again, this is taking into, into a context the how your device is going to be used. So if your device, I don't know uh, exactly what your device is, Olivia, but if your device is intended to be used, um, let's say once a day, every single day, day after day after day, and let's further assume that the device is intended to be used in the same way uh, each time, day after day after day, I think quite honestly, it's an unrealistic expectation to assume that the user is going to read your your directions for use each time they use their device uh, after you know uh, every single day. So measuring the retention, uh, I think is the word that Olivia used, um, uh, their ability to remember how to use the device as intended over a period of time does make sense. And so assuming that it does make sense, you know, giving your device to a person and seeing how they do it on how they use it on day one and comparing that to how they use it on day two and how they do use it on day seven and on day 14 and so on. I think that makes sense. Again, I don't think this is a huge burden for a company to do. If your device is intended to be used over a period of time, I think it's a reasonable expectation that the company test the device, in this case, usability testing over that same period of time. The last thing that I would add, John, and then feel free to, to chime in either with your comment or the next question. Somebody's going to ask me, well, how long does it, you know, should we carry this on? Well, my most obvious answer is, you know, follow your labeling. So most likely in your labeling, you're going to say in some way that your device is intended to be used for a period of one week or two weeks or six months or whatever it is. If that's the case, then just like we do with any other testing, you should probably test your retention, uh, to use that word, over at the very least that particular period of time. So again, hypothetically speaking, if your device is intended or labeled to be used for two weeks, you should test it over two weeks. But as a good engineer, John, I think putting in a little bit of a safety factor is always a good idea because some people, even though it's only labeled to be used for two weeks, are probably going to use it for more than two weeks. So put in a, a safety factor, a fudge factor of maybe 50% or pick whatever number. So our device is labeled to be used for two weeks. However, we know some people are going to use it more. So we're going to test it for three weeks or four weeks or something like that. Uh, in other words, you want to do a little bit of over testing. This is for anybody that knows something about engineering. This is not unique to usability testing. The same basic principles I'm, uh, uh, you know, applying for for testing across the board. What would you add, John, or maybe move on to the next question? Uh, what would I add? Uh, well, I think you're spot on. Of course, um, you know, if if my product is supposed to be used, I have to. You know, for a specific duration of use, I need to address the usability for at least that duration of use, and and you know, to your point, even beyond if if that period of time is a couple of weeks, then I, I absolutely should I shouldn't stop at two weeks and think, oh, it's good. Um, you know, I need to factor in how people are going to really use my product, and I think that's you know maybe a a key point on usability. Uh, which will lead me to, uh, we'll try to squeeze in one more question. Uh, I know we're right at the, the, the end of our time, but uh, and this comes from Nathan, is what usability testing methods would you recommend for validating directions for use or the DFU? Um, you know, you, you hit on it earlier, uh, you know, you, ha you can't assume that, that the DFU is going to be used or followed. And, and so maybe this is a great way to kind of wrap things up today with Nathan's question. Well, sure, John. Uh, that is a good question. Thank you, Nathan, for asking that question. Validating the directions for use, in my opinion, is exactly analogous to what we've been debating about for decades when it comes to the informed consent form for a clinical trial. For decades, people have been arguing about the understandability of the informed consent form. And I think the exact same challenges apply here. Uh, obviously, you want to write your directions for use uh, as, as understandably as you can uh, in, um, in, um, um, uh, uh, informed consent forms are typically tried to be written at the fourth grade reading level which kind of says something about the you know the educational system at least here in the United States when we're you know applying to the, the lowest common denominator of the fourth grade reading level but nonetheless 
you know, uh, doing something to assess whether somebody, uh, you know, reads or understands your uh, your instructions, um, I think is 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 it's very important. Um, how you actually do that? What particular uh, method uh, in the um, uh, additional information request that I uh, shared with you earlier in the webinar from FDA, they mentioned one specific method for uh, assessing understandability, but that's highly debatable. There are other methods that can be used. I don't think it really matters very much which method that you use, um, as long as you try to validate it somehow and maybe validate it via a couple of methods. But the last thing that I would say on this one, John, and then feel free to, to add in or wrap this up, is the underlining assumption here, and this in my opinion is a huge assumption, the underlining assumption here is that somebody is actually going to read it. Because if they yeah. don't read it, then, you know, asking the question, do they understand it, it becomes an entirely a moot point. Right? So, yeah, and in exactly. my opinion, John, you know, not to go off on a you know, quick, quick tangent here, but a, a good engineer will design a product, including a medical device, where you really don't need to read an instructions for use. Think about it this way, John. When you go to Walmart and you buy a toaster, how many people read the instructions for a toaster before they use it? Most people probably don't. I certainly don't. Medical devices should, as much as possible, be designed uh, in, in that kind of way. Is that naive? Perhaps a little bit. But if we set our, 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 our the bar higher, we will achieve more. If we set the bar so low that we just about trip going over it, then what have we really accomplished? Something to think about. Yeah, absolutely. And I, and I want to um, just get people thinking a little bit that are that are listening today. You know, how many products do you use in your daily life where you actually read uh, the directions for use or the instructions for use? Um, you know, I'm going to guess or I'm going to confess, rather, I, I hardly ever do. Uh, now, so, sometimes when it comes to assembling things, you, you have no choice. Uh, and I, I like question. And Nathan's question a great deal about that because there's been plenty of times that, that I've purchased something that where assembly was required and I tried to follow the directions for use and it didn't make any <laughs> sense too. So, so it is important, um, but don't rely on it for sure. So anyway, I want to wrap things up.